As I was going through the reading this week, there were a couple of things that I really, um, I think are critical art to our discussion about money. And I wanted to make sure that you guys are kind of caught up to all of this. The first is the issue of trust as it relates to money. Did you guys pick up on that? And really do we trust God? Um, two key concepts in the Christian faith are faith and trust. And it's huge when we start to talk about resources and finances. Um, faith, do we believe what God and Christ have said in the word? Do we believe that Christ is who he said he is? Do we demonstrate our faith in our actions, right? And then on the trust side, do we trust God for what he promised to do in his word? And do we trust Christ for what he said he would do with the gift of salvation? Key concepts in our faith. Um, the passage listed in your text is Proverbs 3, 5, and 10. So if you have that, you have your Bibles, open that up. Proverbs 3, 5 through 10. Um, listen to the passage. Here you go. 3, 5 through 10. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will... Make your paths straight. Hmm. Do not be wise in your own eyes, for the Lord, for, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Two more. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled and with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Interesting passage after the verse that we started class with last week. Remember, what, what did the guy do last week with his barns? You Remember? He wanted to feel good, right? So he built bigger barns, and he filled those barns, and then he did what? He ate, drank, he was happy, right? And then what happened? That night he was taken up, right? Well, this verse kind of reflects on barns again, but it says, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So it's not the intent of this person to do what the last guy did, right? But it's gonna happen. And there's security that would come with that by doing what's right with God. There's a couple of interesting things in this passage that I want to make sure you see. This passage is talking about good versus evil. The reference to making your path straight is not talking about when we don't know which way to go. You know, there's a fork in the road and I can go this way and it's not a bad way. Or I, could, I can go this way and that's not a bad way either. But I just don't know which way to go. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about there's a choice to be made following God's direction for you, which may not look the most appealing, but you know that's where God would have you. Or this wide road over here, wow, that's a super highway, you know? And which way are you gonna go? It's talking about good versus evil, an option of two different choices, two different paths. And the question is, who do we trust? Do we trust God and what we know his choice for us to do and be? For money, um, trust means that all we have is God's and that whatever he calls us to do with it, we must do. Hmm. Do you ever feel like um, you really don't want to do what you think you should do? Anybody? Be honest. Do you ever feel like you want to do something other than what you know you should do? You know that, that hand cramp we talked about last week when your offering plate comes around and you know you should give and you just, I'm, I can't get back there to get my wallet. I don't know, it's a hand cramp, right? There's, there's those times where we opt to do something different than what we know we should do. Um, this, is, this was a, an amazing thing for me. I had a friend that uh, went to church with us at Yorba Linda Friends. Never been to India, never seen the Indian people. He'd had a guest speaker come to the church and, and uh, talked about the Dalit people, and he'd seen some pictures of the Dalit. And he was, re he was retiring. He retired from a pretty good position, but his income was now fixed, right? He didn't have the money to do much other than kind of hunker down and retire strong. And um, God came to him in a dream, and he said, in the dream to this guy, you need to build 10 schools in India. Okay, schools are about 50 grand each. This guy wasn't working, right? And he had no question about it. He, he heard it, he came to the church, he said, God has spoken to me in a dream, I wanna build 10 schools in India. 
uh, that's a ton of money. I mean, that's a lot of money for somebody that's not making an income. And his passion turned, you know, with this prayer, or excuse me, with this dream, his passion turned towards the people and the children in India. And he stepped out and he's actually completed in the five years since that happened, he's completed all of those schools. And God has provided money to him in amazing ways, ways you'd never believe money's come through. Have any of you, not rhetorical, have any of you had God speak to you in that way? How does God speak to you guys? What do you got, Daniel? Isn't that cool? Yeah, so you stepped out, you gave money, God returned it in ways that you weren't expecting. Cool, anybody else? And did he, was it an audible voice you heard? That's amazing. Any, anybody else had an audible voice? Really? Have you? Um, okay. And uh, yeah, my friend was like doing her YWAM, um, her staffing for the year, and there was just, Wow. And um, so I gave it to her and didn't really like ex explain much. Yeah. Um, and she called me and said that that was like exactly what she needed for that month in order to stay. That's cool. That's cool. And again, it was kind of an audible. Any other audibles? Audible calls are the best. Wow. That's really cool. How about other ways? How, how else does God speak to you guys? For me, oftentimes it's music, especially if I'm going something, through something really tough, and if I'm you know, listening to Christian music, or even secular music sometimes can speak to you. God can use all kinds of ways. But the words to music, if, if you listen, some, sometimes really make a difference. I wish I got audible. Sometimes it feels kind of you know, like you, you know what's right, uh, but, you know, other ways. Any, anybody in dreams? Anybody get dreams? Usually in class there's one or two. Do you? It's, it's a fascinating thing to think about how God can kind of speak to us. Um, I, got a, I got an email. This was a couple of years ago because I don't have the license plate anymore. I used to have a license plate that was B-E-E-S-T-L-L, -L, Be Still, um, taken from, from Mark. Um, and I got this email from a gal, and I thought this was kind of fascinating. I'm just going to read it to you real quick, just parts of it. This is from a gal that works here at Biola. She said, this is a true story of God's faithfulness in my life and how God used your license plate to challenge and teach me an important lesson. Um, I guess she's always liked license plates and always tries to figure them out when she sees personalized plates. She said, I don't remember the exact date. It was sometime in the fall of 2008. I woke up in the morning feeling groggy, down. I'd been up several times in the night. Her daughter was very, very sick with a kind of a series of illnesses that they just couldn't figure out. Um, she said, in a mental fog, I sat down at the kitchen table to eat my cereal, drink my morning coffee <clears throat> before heading off to work. Multitasking, I opened up my Bible to read the passage that came next, only to realize that God's speaking in only a half-hearted focus because of the concerns that were competing for my attention. It was the story of Jesus in the boat with the disciples. A big storm hit. The disciples woke Jesus up because they thought they were going to drown. Jesus said, be still and the storm ceased. I remember thinking, I feel like I'm drowning too, and I'm not sure what to do. Help. It wasn't the stereotypical morning devotional prayer, but it was honest. Running a couple minutes late, she packed up her lunch, got in the car, drove on autopilot down Imperial Highway, and uh, the weather outside was bad. And all of a sudden, while stopped at a traffic light, my eyes were drawn to a license plate in the car in front of me. It said, be still. It was one of those times God spoke through random, seemingly unrelated things. His still small voice pierced through the fog in a way I can hardly describe. Be still. The words echoed in my mind as I walked to the office. At first I didn't realize why it sounded so familiar. Slowly it dawned on me that I'd read the same phrase just moments earlier from Luke 8, through 25. This time expecting God to speak. Jesus said, be still and the storm ceased. The disciples asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and sea obey him. 
Jesus challenged them about their lack of faith. So she prayed, okay, God, I'm sorry for my lack of faith. Will you forgive me? Will you please show me your solution to these challenges? And she said, he spoke to my inner soul, relax, be still. I've got it. Very cool story to me. Um, she said, that day I had another decision to make. I trusted Jesus with my eternity, but what about today? And what about tomorrow? I decided to stop trusting in myself and surrender completely to Jesus, believing he would work things out in, in his way this time. Fascinating. A personalized license plate, you know? How cool is that? Um, it was pretty special because she didn't know that was me. And later she discovered that it had a Biola sticker and she tracked down the plate and she sent me that note. I thought, how cool, you know, it's worth the extra hundred bucks. Now I don't have it anymore, but uh, it, was a, it was a cool story. One of my um, favorite passages in scripture is a story of the widow's might. So please turn to, for those of you at home, you can do this as well. This is really free, this really bugs me, this is funny. I love it. Um, please turn to Mark 12, 41. This is about, this is a great story. It's a, it's a gift of about a penny. That's what we're talking about here. Mark 12, 41 through 44. The story of the widow's might. And he sat down opposite the treasury, this would be Christ, and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they put in of their surplus, but she out of her poverty put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Can you kind of picture this? I, I, you know, envision this. Christ is kind of sitting in the corner, right? And there are a lot of guys coming in, and I'm sure they were kind of coming in like this, and these are the guys that have the money. And they would reach back and they'd pull that money out and they'd make sure everybody was seeing it and they'd slap that in, you know, and they'd go sit in their appointed spot, right? And Christ is watching and he knows their heart, right? And then the widow comes in and I'm pretty sure she probably came in late and kind of quietly and embarrassingly looked at what she had and she'd seen what they were doing and she was kind of just hoping nobody saw what she put in, right? Interesting to kind of think about that. Um, a couple of thoughts for your notes from this passage. Number one, Christ was watching the people. God cares about what we give and about what we do, right? He watches, he knows what we do. When we get the hand cramp at church, right? He knows what we do and he cares about what we give and what we do. Number two, God cares what the motivation of our heart is. He knew the motivation of those that were given those big gifts and doing them kind of flauntingly in front of everybody. Look what I'm giving. Hey, did you see this? Right? And he knew the motivation of the heart of the widow. He knew that that's all she had, that she wasn't gonna be able to eat, right? It was her last money. And number three, God knows about our sacrifice. And he knows about our needs. He knew the situation of the widow. And I've always believed knowing Christ's character that he would have made sure that this woman was cared for later. He would have said, you know, she gave all she had. Let's make sure that she's taken care of. Other places in scripture talk about that. She demonstrated trust in God for his provision. Hmm. An interesting campaign slogan that I've seen at church we've used quite a bit is uh, not equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. Not equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. And as you guys think about giving, we're going to talk more about that throughout the semester. I want you to begin to kind of understand what that means. Not equal gifts. You're all not able to do what some of the other people are able to do. Some of your tuitions are paid for, right? Some of you are taking out a ton of loans to pay off your tuition. You don't have the same kind of resources. Some of you have amazing jobs already. Some of you are kind of scraping it together to make it day to day, right? We don't have the same kind of resources, but we're all called to give. It's one of the questions I hear a lot from students. You know, I'm paying tuition, I'm trying to eat, I can barely scrape to, you know, money for gas. 
should I give? Do I need to give to my church? Well, what would this story kind of tell us? God's watching. He knows your heart. He knows your intent. And yeah, you should. And we're called to be sacrificial givers, right? And perhaps even living sacrificially. Um, I'm going to have you uh, read a quick little paper, and then I'm going to have you talk a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about it. Send those back that way. The article is called The Gospel of Wealth, uh, written by David Brooks. And it talks a little bit about um, how we have had such a transition in the last 15 years where at kind of the turn of the century, we saw a, a passion for stuff, you know, bigger cars and bigger things. And the world of the mega church was really kind of blossoming. Some of the churches that are out there, anybody attend a mega church now? Quite a, quite a few, a couple of you. A mega church is like anything. In, actually, a mega church can be anything over like two to three thousand members. Okay, maybe you thought it was bigger than that. Anybody attend a mega church? Let's try that again. Okay, a few more. Um, mega churches are fascinating to me. I've attended mega churches. Friends is a mega church. Evie Free is a mega church. You know, a number of the churches that we have attended would be very much considered mega churches. Uh, and then he, he begins to talk a little bit about the call to a simpler life. Okay? Um, let's talk a little bit about this. First question, is there a place for the mega church? What do you guys think? Is there a place for the mega church in our culture today? What do you think? Say, why not? There's no reason to question it. We don't like big churches. Like <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. If you don't like big churches, you won't like, it's a big church. That's true. What do you, I, why do you say that? Do you think there's what is it about the, the mega church you like? Um, I think if the church is big, they're doing something right. Yeah. Not that a mom and pop church isn't, but they are going to be successful. Okay. So because some of the pastors may be doing a better message, or what do you guys think? Yeah. Um, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that it is a church of Bible teaching, reading, or receiving. Okay. Because the church is run against the main culture, which is like, okay, with a corporation, here's our five strategies for the people in. And numbers equates to success, where Jesus says to me, they're going to fall away again. Yeah. So I'm looking at numbers. Yeah. Where they can kind of disappear back into the. Yeah. Which happens a lot in the, in the mega churches, in the big churches. People kind of disappear. It's easier to sit in a pew at a big church in the back and slide out at the end of the service than it is in a small church where you go in and everybody <laughs> turns to see who's walking in, right? Yeah, what do you think? Well, what I've seen is a lot of mega churches, they develop around a person mm -hmm. or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And when that person is no longer there, then they rise big and then they fall. Yeah, um, yeah. And you see that with like Chris Cathedral and things yeah. like that. So they're personality driven churches because of the, who's, in the, who's in the pulpit that side. And not community. Yeah. And so that's why I think smaller you see a lot more community. Yeah. No matter who comes in and who comes out, the community is still there. Okay, anybody think that um, the little churches are the best? Any little church people? What do you think? Why? So more opportunity for, for really spiritual growth in small churches. Now, how about the um, small group discipleship kind of stuff in a mega church? Does that counterbalance? Yeah, I guess it does. It can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What? Are you, who? Any other little church advocates? Well, I was going to talk. About oh, you can, please. Yeah. But I've seen churches like come together and uh, like kind of pull resources and like, why are we doing all these yeah. things separate? And Great resources. Like, yeah. Like, why not combine our ministries and provide? Yes. Yeah, great point. Um, seeing many churches come together, pooling resources, it has the same impact as having a mega church. Because that's one of the battle cries for the mega church. They say, you know, we've got, we've got discipleship, we've got 
divorce recovery, we've got drug rehabilitation, we've, you know, the, the list of benefits is usually pretty long. And the small churches go, well, we've got a men's uh, growth program. You know, it's not, it's not the same because they don't have necessarily the financial resources to make that happen. It's not always a bad thing though, right? And I think that's what this article is talking about. As you see it kind of flow, he begins to say, we've, we've kind of sold out to the bigger is better mentality, right? How about this? Are we called to a simpler lifestyle? What do you guys think? You are entering a culture that says more is better, right? Bigger is better, better cars, right? Bigger cars, nicer, faster things, right? Shiny things, bigger televisions. You've got a 60 inch, I've got a 90 inch. You know, that, isn't that what we're hearing? What do you think? Is there truth to this in the article? What do you think? Talk to me, yeah. Sometimes when you think it's a negative it seems like they're excluding Christianity. Mm. The will of God can be for us. Yeah. Smoke and Smoke. yeah, angels. I like the angels. That's actually really cool. <laughs> There's some truth to that. Yeah. Uh, I think we got into the this in the last time. I think, I guess it's to people, but I, I, I think like you can realize God so much better if you walk with Him modestly. Yeah. Yeah. Did you guys hear that? You can utilize wealth better if you live modestly. Yeah. I mean, it's just like you know, the more things you have, the more concerned you have. Yeah. Less you have, I mean, the, the less that you extend, the more you have, the more like, you're kind of forced to, to reconcile the power of your students. Yeah. Good. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I love the idea of sitting in the cat. There's one saying, okay, I'm going to live off this match and mm-hmm. everything else. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we'll tend to do that. You guys are going to start out as, at a certain rate, right? Right. But every year that you work, you usually get some kind of a cost of living increase. And then if you're really good, it'll go up even more. And it's just kind of natural to say, well, I'm making more money. I can buy more stuff, right? Even if your debt's paid off, if you're making more money, the desire is to go out and use that money, right, to make your life more comfortable. It's kind of the cultural message that we're hearing. Yeah. And when, when it comes to trying to make yourself comfortable, you know, just the whole Christian life is not about seeking comfort. Absolutely. And so living a simple lifestyle means it's easier for you to drop everything and go if God tells you to. Yeah. You know, it, like, it keeps you more attached to things in heaven than attached to it. Do you know people that are doing that? Like Dropping everything? Yeah. Yeah. But not many. Mm-hmm. It's more often the other side. And, and there are so many people that just kind of want to acquire, right? It's not about them. It's about what I can do with what I have, right? I hope you kind of picked up on that. And I hope you begin to think about that as we work through the semester. Um, One of the most profound moments, a couple of transitions here in thinking, one of the most profound moments in our lives is when we first realize our lack of trust in God during a a period of testing. You know what I'm talking about? When you're being tested with something and you're not looking to God for the answer, you're looking to yourself maybe, or, you know, just kind of responding. So the most profound moment in our lives can be when we first realize a lack of trust of God during a period of testing. You know what I'm talking about? That, that time, that the oops or aha moment after you've been tested where you've really messed up. That's what many of us come to going back to that passage, the fork in the road that we were reading about in Proverbs 3, where there's a choice to be made one way or the other, right? Um, supporting someone we know we should support or realizing that God will supply all of our needs if we step up to the test. That's really the tough one. 
You know, if like you guys were talking about when you talked about when God spoke to you, how do you know that God's going to be faithful to make sure that you're cared for if you're caring for somebody else? Well, there's, there's an element of trust and faith in that giving action that I think is so important. Um, usually, <laughs> what we usually say when we're tested is, but God, I don't, or but God, I can't. But what we're really saying is, God, I won't, right? God calls you to do something. You feel the prompting in your spirit, and you go, oh, but I don't have, ooh, I can't. Uh, and it's really, I won't, right? So it's a matter of saying and reflecting on Scripture and the faith that we can draw from through His promises. Um, <laughs> this, this story's a little hard to tell, but uh, this was years ago when Julie and I were first married. And anybody been to the Sawdust Festival in Laguna? I love the Sawdust Festival. It's really a cool thing. If you haven't been down there, Laguna's kind of a high, you know, kind of this kind of highbrow area. But the, the Fine Arts Festival is really cool. You go in the Sawdust Festival portion of it, is like all crafts and arts and stuff. Julie and I hadn't been married very long and we went down. We didn't have a ton of money. We had a, you know, we're making a little bit of money. She's, she was a nurse, so she was making more than me. And we went down to the Sawdust Festival and we didn't have a ton of money to spend. And I got up to the front and it was like $8 a ticket. And I went, oh, all right, $8, I can swing that. We'll have just a little bit of money left and when we get in, we should be fine. I give the gal a 20 at the ticket booth. She gives me back 15 bucks, right? And I, and I kind of, I didn't really count it, and she grabbed it, and I got it, and I walked in. I looked, and I went, $15. God has blessed me with resources, you know? And so I had paid less than what I needed to. Well, I took the money, and we went, and Julie, um, I think we decided we were hungry, we wanted something to eat. And we went up, and I went to pay for the food, and I gave him a 10, and we got our food, and she handed me change. It was a $10 bill. So I got free food. And I kind of got it and I realized and I said, oh, free food, yeah, you know, this is great. Well, that was my second test, right? Third test, took the same money, right? <laughs> Julie had a pot that she saw that she liked, and it was like eight or nine bucks, I forget what it, what it was. And I gave him the 10 bucks <laughs> from my original 20. <laughs> And I got the pot and I got $10 change back. Yes! And I kind of went back and I said to Julie, people keep giving me money. And she said, I think you're maybe being tested and you're, and you're failing. And I went, oh yeah, maybe. She said, I think you should go back and, and you know, pay all the things that we have purchased with, you know, like you should. And I went, yeah, I guess. Have you ever gone back to somebody that gives you too much change back and tried to give them money and say, you gave me too much change, and they go, no, I didn't. Well, that's what it was, it was really funny. Went back out to the ticket person, and I said, you know, I really, I need to pay you some more, and they kind of looked at me like I had three eyes. But I said, no, really, and I gave it to them. But I went to all three spots and paid them back. But I, this was one of those moments where I was being tested, right? And I was, and I was failing, because I was kind of really excited about what I was doing, right? But I realized, and Julie kind of helped convict me that, we need to be faithful in the little things like that, right? It's so, so important. Um, faith and trust will be demonstrated by actions. Did you get that? Faith and trust will be demonstrated by our actions. And I want you to look up with me, James... 2, verses 14 through 26. James 2, 14 through 26. Interesting section of scripture here. I love it. This is actually a, a great passage when we talk about what it means to be saved by faith versus works. Here we go. What use is it, my brother, when if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can the faith save him? Well, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? 
Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works and as a result of the works faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. This is really a key verse right here. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Um, This passage to me, especially if you look at verse 24 is really important. I've got in my, in my Bible, and I, if you guys want to do it too, I put a couple of eyes. I, I drew some eyes on here for the UC because this is not UC comma, right? That a man is justified by works. It's UC that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. We are called to be active in our faith, right? We are called to give when God asks us to give. We are called to help a roommate taking a trip if God calls us to do that, right? Part of, the, part of the challenge is being in tune and in touch with what God is calling you to be and seeking ways like the license plate where he can speak to you, right? Whether that's scripture, whether that's music, whether that's the voice of a friend, you know, whether it's the sermon on Sunday, listening to the voice and the prompting of the Spirit And then doing what this passage is talking about. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Great passage. Interesting passage. Um, There's a story when this was early, early in the time when they were building railroad tracks across the country. And there was a big river that they were crossing. And this engineer came up with a brand new way to build a bridge. or one of the first suspension bridges built in the country. And he built this amazing bridge. It was beautiful, and, but it didn't look like there was support. And the railroad said to him, that's not going to work. You can't take a train across. It's too heavy, right? And they said, we're not going to use it. And he said, well, we built it. And they, he, they said, we're not going to use it. We don't trust our equipment on there. He said, okay, um, how much is a train? He asked one railroad company, and they gave him a price. He said, how much is your train? And they gave him a price. He said, I'm going to buy both of those. And we're going to do a demonstration. Well, he pulled both trains, nose to nose, right, together on the center of his suspension bridge. It would never have that much weight. And everybody's watching to see what happens. And sure enough, it supported both trains. And I'm sure he was kind of sweating too. And he demonstrated by his actions his belief, right? He demonstrated, I trust my design. And I'm sure he probably was kind of holding his breath. But I trust my design enough that I'll spend the money to show you that it'll work, right? I think that's what we're talking about, the importance of demonstrating our belief in our actions. The designer knew it. He had faith. The engineers proved it, right? I got an executive memo from a friend of mine. He's a Biola alum. His name is Mike Ryan. And I love this little story because it's, it's kind of related to what we're talking about And it's about showing up when you need to show up. The passage is 2 Samuel 11.1. And the verse says, Then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabeth. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Here's what... Here's what Mike Ryan says. He said, then it happened. You know, in life, very few things just happen. Most of what occurs is a result of our intentional activity or inactivity on our parts. In this verse, we find that King David chose inactivity and leisure by remaining in Jerusalem. Normally in the spring, the king would go out to battle. But this time, David intentionally chose to stay behind. You could say that the resulting sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah came about because 
David was at the wrong place at the wrong time. The truth is he was in the wrong place because he wasn't in the right place. He should have been with the commanders and the soldiers defending his nation. King David chose to avoid the noble activity of battle and found himself pursuing fleshly activities and spiritual defeat at the hands of his own lust. It would have been so much easier for David had he just focused on the job that he was to do. How about you? Are there things that require your attention, but you just want to break from the routine? Are there responsibilities that belong to you, but you've given over to others? How about your spiritual growth? I love that challenge because I think it's something where we all can kind of see what he's talking about. Are there areas in our lives where we have opted not to do what God is calling us to do? Wow, pretty powerful. What we believe will be played out in our actions. That's kind of the goal of this class. I want to change what you believe and how you act, right? I want to change what your view of money is so that you will act differently when God calls you and that you'll be attentive to what you hear from Him. I want to change your belief about what you should do with your money so that it would play it out in your actions. Um, recognizing our true self-worth, the authors in faith and money note three important things. Get these down in your notes. Number one, for your notes, we should find our identity in Christ to find true contentment not in things. You aren't what you have. You aren't what you drive, right? The world would not kind of tell you that, but it's true. We should find our identity in Christ. Luke 12, 15, beware of every form of greed because even when one has abundance, his life does not consist of his possessions, right? That's big. We are not what we have. Number two, Filling the heart's void with things. We talked a little bit about the empty self. <clears throat> We're going to hear more about that in the coming weeks from our guest speakers. Um, oftentimes, having more just means that there is more stress in your life. Have you ever really talked to a wealthy person and they're so concerned about what the stock market's doing or what their investment properties are doing or I just about lost that last year and, you know, they're so grieved over what they have and if they didn't have it, life would be so much easier, right? So there's an element of that. More stuff just means more stress in your life. More stuff, more anxiety. Only in Christ can we have the right understanding of ourselves. And number three, the danger of the misuse of money will make you a slave to someone else. Did you guys pick up on that? You know what that's talking about? It means if you have credit card debt and God calls you to do a missions team next summer and you've got to service this 15 grand on your credit card, there's no way you're going to wherever you're supposed to be called to, right? It means that if you've got a really, really nice new car and God calls you to support somebody in the church or build a building or whatever, I, I'd love to help. And uh, my spirit says I should help, but I got to make a car payment of 700 bucks, right? That's kind of where we've got to be sensitive. So the danger of the misuse of money will make you a slave to someone else. Credit cards and credit can derail what God has for you to do and be. These are three really important things, and I hope you guys kind of get it. Sure. Number three, the danger of the misuse of money will make you a slave to someone else. And that would be credit card companies, it would be home loan companies, you know. You can take a loan from a friend that you shouldn't take the money, but maybe you need it. Oh, I mean, nothing will break up a friendship like a loan. <laughs> so be careful. I mean, that's an area where you really got to be careful. Taking loans from your parents. You know, we've loaned both our kids money to buy cars. That, you know, I had, I had faith, and we're going to talk more about that uh, on co-signing for loans, but I had faith that my girls would pay me back. And both of them were awesome. Both of them made payments, they got their cars paid off, and now they've got established credit because they did that. The book kind of, we'll talk more about it, but the book kind of talks that down a little bit. I'm a little more open if you know who you're making a loan to. But realize that problems can come through the lending of money. Um, I thought this was an interesting article. And I'm kind of going over my 45 minutes of lectures, but nobody's calling me on it, so I'm going to keep going. Um, this is called The Secret Fears of the Super Rich. <laughs> I love this article. This was in The Atlantic. 
um, last year. And it talks about the super yacht world and um, how yacht owners would want something bigger and better because they wanted to be able to look from the top of their yacht down on lower, smaller yachts, right? So they wanted the bigger yacht, not really because of any real reason other than they wanted to be able to gaze down at other people and go, hi there, you know, I see your little yacht. Yeah, look at, my, look at my yacht, right? That's the super rich, that's how they were thinking. Um, the study was titled, The Joys and Dilemmas of Wealth. But given that the joys tend to be self-evident, it focused primarily on the dilemmas, on the dilemmas. The respondents turned out to be generally a dissatisfied lot whose money was contributing to deep anxieties involving love, work, family. Indeed, they are frequently dissatisfied even with their sizable fortunes. Most of them still do not consider themselves financially secure. For that, they would say they would require, on average, one quarter more wealth than they currently have. Now, these are people, the extremely wealthy, I think the, the category was 500 million or more that these people had, right? The, uh, I guess, you know, you, you kind of read this, and one respondent, the heir to an enormous fortune, says that <clears throat> what matters most to him is his Christianity. And his greatest aspiration is to love the Lord, my family, and my friends. Okay, this is one of these guys. He also reports that he wouldn't feel financially secure until he had a $1 billion banknote. <laughs> okay, what's wrong with that picture? I love the Lord. You know, I love my family, and as soon as I get a billion dollars, I'll be happy. That, my friends, is a problem. Interesting. Um, the author goes on to say, sometimes I think that the only people in the country who worry more about money than the poor are the very wealthy. They worry about losing it. They worry about how it's invested. They worry about what effect it's going to have. And as the zeros increase, the dilemmas get bigger. Typically, he says, an inheritor's angst arrives in early adolescence, and it blossomed when she arrives at college and in a group of peers unaware of her wealth, discovers what it's like to be treated as a normal person. She may keep her wealth hidden for a while until at some point she is outed and her friends suddenly look at her differently. In some cases, an inheritor isn't even fully aware of the wealth she has. Amazing. Um, fascinating kind of study. One of the saddest phrases I've heard this author says in his time counseling people is when someone says, honey, you're never going to have to work. The announcement is often made, he explains, by a rich grandparent or grandchild to a grandchild. And it rarely sounds as good to the recipient as the one delivering it. Because a life of you never have to work, where's your purpose? Where is what you're going to be? I mean, it sounds really good on the outside. You guys will not have to work, you know? But so many of these people, they have no life purpose. Over but the overwhelming concern of the super rich mentioned by nearly every parent who participated in the survey is their children. Many express relief that the kids' education was assured, but are concerned that money might rob them of ambition. Having money runs the danger of giving them a perverted view of the world. Fascinating study. Um, as you think about what we have, what we're called to do with what we have, and you're reading this material, um, it's pretty amazing to me to see the dangers of resources like this. The authors go on to kind of talk about how money impacts our family, how we view money can impact the career decisions. How many of you are picking your career, and be honest, right? So this is for, you know, just kind of, we're family here. How many of you are picking your career based on how much money you're going to be able to make? Be honest. One. Two. Is that it? The rest of you? <laughs> really? So what do you want to do? Screenwriter. screenwriter. Yeah, you can make a ton, right? Getting yeah, Starbucks <laughs> screenwriter, right? Or, yeah. What are you going to do? Speech therapy. Speech therapy, and you'll make what? You have the potential to make a ton if, you, if you're good at what you do. You have the potential to make good money, probably 80 to 100 to start maybe, right? And you could increase that. Anybody else? What are you going to do? I'm working as an estimator right now. Okay. Yeah, you can do real well as an estimator. That's good money. That's decent. Are you picking that path for the purpose of making money? Right now, yes. Okay. So yeah. Is it wrong to pick a job career for how much money that you can make? Who would say yes? Anybody? <laughs> really? 
Is it perfectly acceptable? What would you, why would you say that? I would say maybe it's wrong because the purpose of life is not to make money. Mm -hmm. If you want to make money to give more to the Lord, then it's okay. But if it's just for your own yeah. pleasure. Yeah. It, yeah, if, it, if you've got a passion to do yard work <laughs> and you choose to become a brain surgeon. Yeah, and if you're not doing what the Lord's gifted you in because yeah. you want to make money, then I'm not sure if I Yeah, know. yeah, I see that hand. I think, uh, yeah, I think it depends on something. Like, I didn't pick, I picked it from my passion first, but I think um, many people that respect that are very successful they do it from passion first, and they would, they would say that if you do it for the money alone, then it's, a, it's an empty road because yeah. if yeah. money's your only motivation, then money's not coming. Or you have yeah. money. Or you have money. Yeah. Um, either, either you, you, you feel like you're just taking up the space. Yeah. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah, and, and there's some, you guys ever hear the story about the greyhounds? There was a greyhound race. You know what greyhound races are? That's the dog races that chase the little fake fluffy cat or whatever it is. I guess they chase a rabbit. And the rabbit takes off and the dogs see it and they all go chasing after it, right? This was a, this was a race that was done. They had all these greyhounds all lined up. The gates opened up. The greyhounds took off after this thing. About halfway around the track, the, ra the rabbit died. It just quit. And the dogs caught it. And they caught it and they were just, all excited and pretty soon they, they caught their trophy, right? And they started fi fighting and biting each other. It was like mayhem out there because they'd never caught the rabbit before. The, the rabbit had always gone. And, <laughs> and I think it probably ruined all of them because they, this isn't that great. We caught the rabbit, what's next, you know? And I think there's some truth to that. If you pick a job for the resources and the resources come, it needs to be more than the resources, right? What were you going to say? I think you had your hand up a while ago. How many of you are, are selecting your job or your career based on what your parents want you to do? Tough question. Anybody? Really? In a class this big, I'm kind of surprised. Um, how about um, school pressure to do something? Are you feeling any school pressure? I, I felt that because I went into Christian education. Um, I was going to be a youth pastor, right? I did it for a year and I thought, what am I? And I did it while I was still in school. I was like a junior. And I got that first job, and it was, what in the world? But then you're so far into it. You know, you're a junior, you're a senior. This isn't what I really want to do. But you kind of get to the place where you've got to do it because you're that far into it. We're going to talk more about jobs down the road here in a few weeks. And I guess my encouragement is make your job your passion, you know? Find a way to make money doing what you love. Because if you can do that, how cool is that? It's something that, that you'll be happy in. And I think you guys have done that. And I'm, and I'm excited because I think both of you have hit a passion. You know, if, you're, if you want to uh, affect society, screenwriting is an amazing way to do it. If you want to help people, speech pathology is a great way to do it. It's a great, great career path. So I'm, I'm excited to hear that. And I hope some of the rest of you, as you're thinking about your career, have thought about that. I shared a little bit when we started class about um, when Julie and I moved to Atlanta back in 1990. I took a job in Atlanta because it was something I really wanted to do and it was a good opportunity. I went back there and, um, and took this position. We didn't have the money to move Julie out. We had a house in Yorba Linda. It took us for the uh, six months before Julie brought the girls. We had a two-year-old and a four-year-old six months before she moved out to Atlanta to be with me. And I would go home once a month <clears throat> to see Julie and the kids, and they'd go, who is this guy? We don't know him, right? Because they were so little. And it got, finally got to the place where I said, we can't do this, Julie. It's not healthy for us to do this in our marriage. I'm going to bring you out with the girls. We'll live in an you know, apartment, get a little apartment, and we'll rent the house in California and try to sell it. So we did. And it was a year before we sold our house in California and could move into a house in Atlanta. 
During that year, we put all of our stuff in storage, right, in Atlanta. We had it shipped out and put in storage. And about once a week or, you know, maybe twice a, a, a week, we'd go and we'd say, let's see what we have. And we'd open the door to the storage unit and we'd go, we have stuff, look. And then we close the door, right? And we learned so much in that year period about stuff. Because we realized if the family's together, we got a place to sleep and we got a couple of pans, we have a home. You know, this is really all we need. Oh, we had a television too. This is all we need, right? And it was so cool to be together as a family. Well, we were in the house. We finally bought a house in Atlanta. There are four months and I got a call from Biola to come back to California. Okay, let me tell you, when you tell your wife, um, you want to move back to California and she's been kind of homeless for a year and a half, you know? It took a little bit of convincing Julie to come back. But we came back and it took us another year to sell our home in Atlanta. So we lived with her mom and stepdad when we came back. And we put our stuff in storage. <laughs> and we'd go and we'd open the door and say, yes, we have stuff, you know? But we learned so much. But we were driven initially by the job, by what, what we could do. But God used that experience for us to kind of get a handle on what stuff really means, right? Both faith and money in a steward's journey talk this week about money in a spouse or family and how some of the happiest times were times before money. Did you guys pick up on that? Um, when my daughter Andrea and her husband Chris got married, they moved into a little place here in La Mirada, tiny little house. I mean, it was like, it was about this big, you know, this corner right here. And there was, a, there was a teeny tiny little fireplace and a teeny tiny little kitchen and they had a teeny tiny little bedroom. I think elves made cookies there before, before they moved in. It was that small. But they were, they were in love and they loved it. They, this was their home, right? They loved that experience. And I think that's kind of what this is talking about. They were so excited to have that and just be together. And I think that's huge. I think that's really, really important for us. One concept um, about showing the other person respect, did you guys pick up on that in the book? <clears throat> if you're the one doing the bills, if you get married and you're the one doing the bills, um, Ephesians 5.25 for men, this is a great reminder to love your wives as Christ loves the church. And what better way to show that you love your wife if you're doing the bills than to keep her in the loop, right? To keep her in the conversation of how money's being used. So many people don't. You know, if you're the one doing the bills, you don't tell the other person. You kind of know what things are doing, and you don't keep them in the, in the know. I think we're called, especially if it's guys doing the checkbook, make sure your wife is aware of what's going on. That's so, so important. Um, one quick story. I love stories. Um, Julie, did you, get, did you get the thing about um, the great meal v with somebody you really don't like versus a bowl of cereal with somebody you love? So true. When Julie and I were first married, you guys are almost ready for a break. It's been, been a while here. Uh, when Julie and I first got married, um, we used to live right here in La Mirada. And I went home for, I think I'd been at Biola maybe just a week or so. And I went home for lunch, and Julie was going to fix me lunch. It was like, we're a married couple, and she's fixing me lunch. That's so fun. She invited a friend over. And she'd actually um, made some clam chowder. And we sat down and I prayed, you know, did the, my, my husbandly thing. And we sat down to eat this clam chowder. And the three of us took big scoops of clam chowder. And at first it was really good. And then it kind of hit you. This is, there's something, there's something not quite right. Well, you're supposed to make clam chowder with, what do you make clam chowder with? What kind of milk? It's, well, she had used sweetened condensed milk, bottom line. It was, it was bad. And I said, you know, we can eat this, Julie. It's okay. She said, no, we can't, you know? And, she, and we decided to go out for lunch. But I, I, when I was reading this story about, you know, about the cereal, I wouldn't have been anywhere else eating anything else but that bad clam chowder with my wife because it was such a special thing as a, as a newly wedded couple. And I, and I could see what they were talking about. There is so much truth to that. And I hope you guys experience that as you get into relationships. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. 
Visit Biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.